Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Lucia France and this is a show where we bring the solutions to all of your property problems. Now joining me in the studio today we have our expert panel of guests. First of all is Stephen Galpin. Welcome Stephen. He Hi. is a property consultant from London. Joanna Leggett as well, a founding partner of Leggett Immobilia in France. Welcome Joanna. And Paul Mahoney, managing director of Nova Financial Group. Hello. So welcome to you all. Okay, Stephen, we'll get started with you for your very first question. Now, an apartment in Hampstead seems to be a very sound investment for me, writes in one of our viewers, but it seems that recent trends have made Docklands apartments have longer term growth prospects. Is this a fair assessment or should I keep my focus on Hampstead, which, is a, which has a stable history of property growth? Okay, well, quite a complex answer, I'm afraid, because there are a lot, there are a lot of facets to this, um, to this answer. Now, look, first, first of all, Hampstead is a conventional property area. It's long established, well established, and I, I think the viewer's uh, view of it being stable is probably quite right. Let's come down into Docklands and perhaps into Canary Wharf, where we're filming from today. And there are something like 20 or 1,000 apartments scheduled to be completed over the next three or four years. Now, inevitably, that will create a little bit of over-demand in terms of renting and, of course, availability. So you've got to factor that into the, into the equation. Um, we must also remember that in and out costs are also quite considerable today with stamp duty. Um, stamp duty remains with the... Uh, buyer rather than the seller, although we've been campaigning for something different for some time now. Um, so the in and out costs are quite expensive and that's got to be a consideration and of course that's going to reduce your potential profit or growth over the years. I think in general I think it would be accepted that um, this sort of area in Docklands is perhaps potentially more capable of providing uh, extra growth potential. But I, I think the words are be careful. If you don't understand the area, if you're not friendly with local agents who can guide you, then I, I, I'd consider that very, very carefully and maybe stick to the uh, safe areas, I think. Although, having said that, Canary Wharf has changed from being what I would say a sort of financial area mm -hmm. into now it's, it, it's a proper recognised postcode that would be on a tick list of anybody wanting to move to London. So yeah. things are changing, but it takes time. Um, whether you have time with your investment, if it's your home, I think you've got to look at um, what just suits you best as an individual or a family. When you say um, there's going to be around 20,000 new apartments completed over the next three to four years, in, in terms of that, do you think that makes it less of a safe bet then in that case? Well, a lot of those apartments will have been sold overseas to overseas investors, um, a lot of people buying for buy-to-let. But, of course, we see the government now trying to discourage in, in individual buy-to-let. You know, we're, these people are being termed as accidental landlords. The government are trying to increase the amount of institutional investment in, in, in uh, letting property. And that may or may not be right. Um, but surely with such a, a, such a supply of apartments in a limited area, it, it's going to cause problems of a kind. Not problems that are going to last a long time. All these markets iron themselves out over time. But um, again, if, if it's your home, if, if that's where the viewer is living, then consider very carefully whether you're a Hampstead person or whether perhaps you're a Docklands person. The two environments are, are entirely different. Can and I speak, add something to that? Please do. I, I think they mentioned it was an investment. I'm not sure, but if it is an investment, they did. Yes. Um, I would ask the question: Why only those two areas? Right. You know, yeah. there, there are lots of other areas around Greater London and around the UK mm. that could be more suitable, depending on on their goals or their situation. Um, so yeah, that, that that's a question that's not really answered as to why they because they're two very different yeah, areas. You're sure. quite right. Mm. You know, Canary Wharf. Or, or, or yeah, I, I would ask why those yeah. particular areas. I think, I, th I think on top of that, you've also got to consider if, if it is investment rather than home, then what's the purpose of that investment? Is it to have capital growth over a period of time or is it to secure a, a stable rental income? And again, I would say f from that point of view, I'd say Hampstead is probably the safer area. You will tend to get a longer term tenant in that sort of area. Whereas down here in Docklands, you'll get the young professionals that are by nature on the move all the yeah. time. And so your turnover of tenants is higher. 
And would you say, Stephen, as someone who doesn't know the area around here in Docklands particularly well, that there's just very quickly an area that's maybe safer than others or somewhere to look for first? Well, I, I, you only have to look at the areas down here. You can see where the concentration of developments are. Where there is a concentration of development, you'll get infrastructure, you'll get good shops, you'll get good good facilities, where things tend to be brought on, on uh, or, or built on the fringes, where the infrastructure isn't there, I, I, I'd steer clear of. Okay, thanks very much Stephen. Okay, moving on to Joanna, your first question for today. I have a semi-detached neighbour, I think this is obviously a semi-detached house. Um, the other day he knocked at the door to ask if I want to sell him two of my four empty rooms at the back of his part of the house. I surround him at the side and the back. I would never sell, but he made the suggestion that an alternative would be to convert his part of the loft. I would be against this. My question is, if he wanted to build upwards into the loft, he would need to do so on our party wall, presumably. Would he need my permission in that case? Well, first of all, I'd ask the question, why would you oppose it? I mean, if you're in the UK, for example, in a 1930s semi-detached property and your neighbour put in a loft conversion, you'd probably think, that's great, it means I can get one. That's you true, know, yes. The planning permission would go through. And it's always good to get on with your neighbours. I can understand not wanting to sell parts of your own building, mm. but a loft conversion is no different to that as it would be in the UK. Um, it also helps, I think, as well, that particularly in France, I'm not sure of the area they're in, but if it's in a rural location or a countryside, which it does sound like with the fact that there's rooms yes. going around the back, you know, they could move on somewhere else and not be able to sell the house or something else. And if the house gets run down, it's going to devalue their own property. Yeah. Um, so I would always suggest to try to get on with your neighbours as best you can. From the neighbours' point of view, they can apply for planning permission just as you would in the UK for a loft conversion and probably will get granted it. Mm. Um, so the best thing to do would be to try to find an amicable solution rather than have disputes with, with your local neighbour. Definitely. And wh what is it that makes you say you think they probably would get granted that plan? Well, it's the same as the loft conversion in the UK. You know, most semi-detached properties these days, rather than moving, if you don't have the funds to move, you'll go up into the loft. And exactly the same rules apply in, in France to the UK, that, you know, you can apply for planning permission and it's most likely to be granted. Yeah, and it's to create that extra space for... Exactly, you know, for families or, you know, an extra room or, or to in increase the value of the property exactly i mean i, I suppose this neighbor has done it the right way in terms of they've knocked on the door they've tried to you know have a have a proper conversation with them but you know do you think there's any situation where it would be wise to sell th those two of the four empty rooms that if they're not on? being used um and you, you have no intention but saying that you're going to devalue your property because you're losing space that you have on it so i would keep the rooms at the back but a space that doesn't belong to you and it's not really going to affect your building in any way unless it is um, but by the sounds of it, a loft conversion isn't going to affect your property, then I would be, you know, get on with your neighbour and say you're happy for them to go ahead. Yeah, I guess as well, if it's something that could kind of, you know, that was, you were never going to use it, then it's maybe, it's maybe worth doing that. So, great. Thank you very much, Joanna. Okay, Paul, moving on to your first question here today. I'm selling my house in order to buy a slightly larger one. I own this house outright and the new house is just 10k more, which I have in cash. However, would it be possible to apply for a buy to let mortgage on this house? So effectively buy it from myself, then rent it out and use the rent to pay the mortgage. Oh, that sounds okay. confusing. Good question. <laughs> um, yeah, the answer is yes. That They wouldn't need to buy it from themselves though. They could retain the, their current right. ownership okay. of the property and change the use of the property. The, 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 the idea of remortgaging a home you already own um, to buy a new home is what's called let to buy right, okay. um, as opposed to buy to let because you're letting to buy. Yes. It's quite often done for accidental landlords that can't sell their property or just want to keep their property which I believe is, is over half the landlords in the UK. Um, it is a consumer buy to let mortgage and what that means is it, it's, it's more highly regulated than your traditional business buy to let mortgage right, um, okay. because it is a previous home. Um, and because that person in the eyes of a lender wouldn't necessarily be viewed as a business person or investor because they've just kept their home as opposed to going out investing in property to make money. Right. But the answer is yes, they could do it. And in fact, it's probably a good idea um, because, you know, in my view, when it comes to investing in property, really the major benefit is the, is the leverage, you know, the ability for mortgages. Mm. Cash bought by to let 
is okay, but the returns aren't that great when you take into account costs and things. But when you, when you account for the leverage, you know, the fact that you can borrow at pretty low interest rates at the moment, fairly high loan to values and over the long term, that's where you can get quite good returns on, on the cash or equity in your properties. Right. So you know, that person could do that and by the sounds of it, they could probably end up with enough cash to maybe even get another buy to let. Right. Um, so, so yes, you can do it. It is something definitely worth considering. Seek advice on what your options are because it is a specialist type of buy to let mortgage mm -hmm. um, and you know, go about it in the right way to achieve the, the goals they're looking to achieve. I suppose in, in what they're saying here that the new house is, house is just 10K more, it, it would seem crazy not to keep hold of the original property in the first place. Yeah, well, you know, that, that, it it's sounds that they said they've got the cash, so they could just buy the new one cash, but then they've got two debt-free properties, hmm. which in my opinion is an underutilization of their resources. Right. You know, having, having good debt, you know, investment debt that helps you better utilize your money is a good thing. Hmm. Um, and, and it sounds like, given they've only got two properties, don't know anything about the rest of their finances, but it sounds like they've probably got a bit of work to go to build an investable asset base to be financially free or comfortable. And by using debt, that's one way of accelerating that and you know, making it happen quicker. I suppose, sorry, sorry go ahead. I was gonna say, Paul, there's, there's one thing here that uh, you did hit on it. I think people do have to understand that any kind of letting or investment activity is a business. Yeah. And as with any business, you've got to assess the risk. And if these people are relying on the rental from the first property to buy their home, i.e. the second property, then do think about voids. Do think about the times when you don't have that rent coming in, perhaps in between tenancies, that sort of thing. Yeah. Is it sustainable as far as your own finances are concerned? Yeah. It, it is a good point that I probably didn't mention enough, is they should assess whether that property they've bought as a home, an emotional purchase, is actually a good investment. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, guys. That's all we have time for for this half of the show. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back to Property Question Time with our panel of experts here today, Stephen Galpin, Joanna Leggett and Paul Mahoney. So welcome back, guys. On to your next question then, Stephen. And this person who's written in has actually thrown this open to the whole panel, so we'd like to know all your thoughts. I'm keen to know the panel's thoughts as to whether high street shops are worth buying as an investment any longer. Right, well, on, on Property TV, we've recently done some programmes about the high street and talked to one or, one or two of the sort of larger high street landlords, and it's quite interesting, the whole subject. Now, we're, we're seeing in the press every, every day almost the, the woes of high street and whether it's online trading that's ruining it or anything else. And I think the consensus is there are a number of issues. One is the ease of parking, therefore accessibility. Two, the big landlords that have historically controlled the high street, are they in fact now relaxing their covenants about who can go onto the high street, in other words, allowing the smaller businesses on? rather than just the flagship stores. I mean, to somebody like Harrods that's got a, a, a two billion a year sales turnover <laughs> that, you know, the, 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 the council tax doesn't really matter too much. <laughs> but, but, you know, to, to the smaller businesses, although the government have said, well, look, we're going to help the smaller shops on the high street, you do just wonder how many smaller shops there are on the high street to help. So a, a bit, bit careful there. But the interesting thing is, once again, here at Canary Wharf, you've got a shopping centre that's an absolute success. You've got the two Westfields, East London, West London, absolutely teeming at the weekends and at shopping times and mo most other times, yeah. actually. Um, so I think the question has to be, perhaps, are these the new high streets? Has our high street, as it was, become a different animal? And I think the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're going to see over the next few years is a change of investment in the high street to perhaps part residential, part, part entertainment, part dining, part, you know, rather than just a series of multiple stores replicated across the country. Yeah. Now, does that make a good investment? Do you know what? I think on balance it probably would because I think you'd be taking a chance, but I think what you'd be investing is investing in is a sort of reinvented future. I don't think the high street's going to say it stay the same as it has been for many, many years now. Yeah. So if that Absolutely. helps, it helps. If it yeah, doesn't, it doesn't. I'm sure it does. Any, <laughs> any other thoughts there, guys? On um, I think a few things to consider as an investment mm -hmm. is what were the borrowings that are available to you? 
you know, what, what can you borrow to invest? Because again, as I mentioned before, that's a, that's a key um, driver of returns on the actual funds invested. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, I completely agree that that will depend on what you're buying, where you're buying. Um, and who the sort of target market is. I know as a shop owner, you could have various different sort of um, retailers in there, but you should have a bit of an idea of who you're targeting and who who they're going to target, because obviously that's ultimately going to determine uh, your success. So kind of knowing the area obviously is going to help here as well, isn't it? Be prepared for vacancy periods is is one thing, you know. Um, One of the reasons I think residential property is, is far more suitable for the vast majority of people is that the vacancy periods are a lot lower than commercial space. Right. The, yeah. the, the, um, the costs of borrowing are a lot lower and the loan to values are higher. Mm. Um, so, you know, you, I, I would say you'd want to be pretty confident and, and almost a little bit you know, more financially well off than your average person mm. to be looking at that as your standard investment option. Great, okay. Any other thoughts there, guys? Well, I just think, I think Paul's absolutely right about that. And I think there's something else to consider, and it's a point of really self-examination. Just remember, on commercial property, you're going to be negotiating with commercial people. And those people are probably going to have a higher skill set than you in terms of commercial um, negotiating skills and and, and probably financial clout. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be a little bit the underdog in that situation. So make sure you get some good help. Great stuff. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Joanna, your next question here. Um, I need help to buy my first property in France, but you've come to the right person. (laughs) Since France is a huge country and with its many regions, departments and its varied regional and microclimates, it's really difficult for me to decide where in France I should buy. Any advice appreciated? A uh, very short, <laughs> very, very short question, but a huge answer. Um, you've got to do your research. I mean, it's obviously very early stages. The budget is probably going to be the first determination of where you can afford to buy, depending on your budget. Because, for example, if you're on a small budget of, say, €50,000, that writes off the whole south of France. Right, so, yeah. you know, you'd be needing to look in the central regions, um, halfway down France and the southwest, if you're on a very small budget. If you've got a large budget, then obviously all areas are open to you. But I think if it's a holiday home, um, there's different questions. How much time are you going to be spending there? So how much land do you need? Are you looking for an apartment and you want shared ownership, etc.? cetera? Mm. Um, there are so many questions um, <laughs> that you'd need to ask yourself. First of all, I'd, I'd make a criteria list. I'd make a list of what my budget is, what you want to get out of the property, how big you need the property to be, etc. I would talk to big international agents. I would attend property shows in the UK, go along, go to the seminars, listen to all the different areas um, and I would do some recce trips, you know, get over to France, spend some time there because every region is totally different. Mm. Um, you know, if you're in rural France and you don't speak any fr- French at all and you're in the countryside, you can feel quite isolated. If you want to be in a community where there are other Brits or, you know, Dutch or Belgians or English speakers, then there's certain regions that you should be looking at. If you want to be in a region where there's no English speakers, mm. there are other regions to look at. Then there's also the weather. The weather is very different from north to south. Exactly. So some, you know, the southwest of France, for example, can reach 40 40 degrees in the summer, the same as the Côte d'Azur. And if that's too hot and you want something slightly cooler, you may want to move over to sort of Burgundy and the cooler areas in the centre of France. So it's a massive, massive question. Yeah, it is. Um, You've got to do some research and get over to France and see what areas you actually like. Definitely. And they mentioned in the question the many regions, departments and things like that. Are, are there certain areas of France where it's actually easier or more difficult to move to in terms of legalities and sort of no, no, um, it's, it, it would red be tape the, and things like that? Not really, not at all. It's, it's very, the, the laws are the same all across France. I think it depends if it's a permanent residence or a holiday home, really. You've got to look at the roots of how you're going to get there and how you're going to get back. Yeah. I would always suggest, particularly by age, if, if it's a retirement, that you're within half an hour at least of a hospital, doctors and major facilities. So I choose a town, draw a half hour circle around that city actually, where all the amenities are, and choose something around those areas. So it might be worth looking at the cities that you like first. Definitely. Thank you very much, Joanna. Paul, on to your next question then. Um, I'm due to receive some money from my father's will. This will allow me to pay off my mortgage for my property, a two bedroom flat. After my mortgage is paid, I will have an additional amount of money that would be enough to buy a £75,000 one-bedroom flat outright. I even have a potential tenant in mind. I think I would get £400 per calendar 
per calendar month for 450 per calendar month in rental. I was wondering if you would think this is a good idea and if there is anything I need to watch out for. Doesn't okay. say where it is, but I'm guessing well, the it's Well, the price kind of does give some sort of indication of where yeah. it is. Um, it must be in the north of England because yeah. there's not really much to, to buy around that price in, in the south of the yeah. southeast. Um, things to consider. Um, so they've said there that they're looking at buying that property outright. That's correct. In a way, yes. it's somewhat similar to the previous question mm. in that I'd usually discourage people against buying buy to let property outright um, simply because, as I say, it is an underutilisation under of the money. Mm. Um, you know, you're looking at getting. On a, on a net basis, they're probably only, because they said 400 to 450 rents right, a month yeah. for an 80,000 pound property. So that's about a 5% yield. That's not great for a property of that, um, of that value. Right, okay. Um, so on a net basis, they're, um, yeah, they're probably not going to be getting that much when they, when they consider things like management, maintenance, whatever, if it's an apartment, it might, they'll have server charges, ground rent. There's a whole lot of things that will go into you know, the costs of that property. For sure, yeah. um, by taking leverage, you can, re you can actually boost that yield because borrowings are cheap at the moment yeah. um, and boost the ability for growth. Um, so I'd consider whether a mortgage is suitable. Um, again, similar to the previous question, I'd consider whether this property they're looking at is actually a good investment. It seems like this is the first investment they'd be making. It seems so, yes. So seek professional advice on that yeah. um, as to whether it stacks up. Um, where not, not just what it might rent for on a monthly basis because quite often, especially with cheaper properties in less desirable areas, often the yield, the rents can seem quite high mm. but also the vacancy periods can be quite high and the types of tenants can be less attractive than you might want. Right, okay. So quite often, you know, I'll, I'll see opportunities that people show me that the yields are 15% but if your property's empty half the year, you know, it's it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, or if your tenant doesn't pay, or there's, there's a whole load of things to consider so far as whether something stacks up as an investment or not, not just what you think it might rent for on a monthly basis. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to have to stop you there. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you to our panel of experts, Paul Mahoney, Joanna Leggett and Stephen Galpin. If you have any property questions you'd like us to answer, then do get in touch. Info at propertytelevision.tv or go to the website property-tv.co.uk and we'll see you next time.